I'm Dr. Orion Taraband, and this is Psychax, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is, how did we end up here? So many folks are lamenting the current state of affairs between men and women, especially with respect to mating and dating. And a common refrain that I hear echoed in the comments and in my personal life is, how did we end up in this situation? Like, it didn't used to be this way, right? How did things get so bad? How did they go off the rails so much? How did we end up here? It's an interesting question. And I have an answer to this question that comes from a rather unlikely place. And if you can follow me in a spirit of willingness and open-mindedness, I will explain what I mean. The answer to this question can be found, of all places, in the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This is just an incredible film because it has something for everyone. On the surface, it's this really fun martial arts movie with dazzling visuals and great acting. However, the story also contains several profound psychological messages that I just wasn't equipped to appreciate when I first watched the movie over 20 years ago. And if anyone out there knows Mr. Ang Lee, I would be delighted to know whether he thought the following interpretations had any merit. At first blush, the film's script seems almost superficial, like it's just the pretext for the action scenes. And most of the characterization is accomplished through subtle suggestion and indirect reference. However, this is a clue that we're actually dealing with archetypes, aspects of human experience that transcend time and space. In fact, Crouching Tiger is a very modern romance, and its setting in medieval China allows it to comment on modern intersexual dynamics without being found out. So what exactly is the underlying message of the movie? In so many words, the narrative relates the story of the painful and ultimately tragic relationship between the masculine and the feminine, both in society as a whole and in the life of an individual. If you haven't seen the movie, I would highly recommend that you watch it. It is worth two hours of your life, as my analysis will largely assume familiarity with the characters and the story. The main action of the film revolves around the Green Destiny, an ancient sword wielded by Li Mu Bai, a powerful monk. Throughout the film, Li represents the masculine principle. He is strong, competent, and disciplined. And the sword, which is an obvious phallic symbol, represents the legitimate authority of the masculine in so much as it accords with the natural, green, order of things, destiny. We are reminded by Xu Lian, Li's love interest, that he has used the green destiny justly, that is to destroy evil and protect the defenseless. These, coincidentally, are the two edges of the sword, to destroy and to protect, without which the sword functionally could not exist as such. However, the movie begins with Lee's decision to give up the Green Destiny by making a donation of it to his benefactor. And he does this essentially because he's tired. As he tells Xu Lian, the blade only looks pure because blood washes off it so easily. He's tired of the conflict and the trouble because it turns out maintaining law and order is a relentless struggle. And accepting the unsolved case of Jade Fox, the woman who killed his master, there seems to be no real evil brewing owing in no small part to his efforts. So it seems like a good time to retire. This is the first real action that catalyzes all the subsequent events. In a moment of relative peace, the masculine voluntarily abdicates his power and authority. It's important to understand that it would never have been possible for Jen, who represents the feminine principle, to have stolen the sword if it was still in Lee's possession. Just think of how effortlessly he takes the sword back from her at the waterfall. She is only able to take possession of the power and authority represented by the sword because the masculine first abdicated both. Now, this abdication of the masculine created an opportunity for the feminine, in the symbol of Jen, to seize power. And Jen steals the green destiny from the benefactor's compound. And the feminine is motivated to do this because it has suffered under the masculine, both socially in the form of patriarchal control and individually in the suppression of feeling and emotion. 
I really don't like that word, patriarchal, and I think it is woefully misapplied today. However, we can see examples of it throughout the movie. All three of the main female characters, Shulian, Jade Fox, and Jen, uh, have all been negatively impacted by male-dominated uses of power. Lee's master refuted, refused to teach Jade Fox, who was clearly competent because she was a woman, though apparently he had no problem sleeping with her. Shulian is bound to a life of honor-bound chastity when her fiancé is killed, preventing her from having a real relationship with a man. And Jen is being married off by her father to secure his political advantage in spite of the fact that she loves someone else. Shu Lien and Jen confess to each other that neither has ever felt free in her entire life, whereas the freedom of Jade Fox is that of a fugitive, a life of perpetual hiding. Now, the real question of the story is, how is Jen going to end up? The two possibilities are reflected in the lives of the older female characters. Will she end up like her adoptive older sister, Shu Lien, who has submitted to masculine authority, who tries to teach Jen about the importance of rules and respect, and who reminds her that the green destiny belongs to Lee Mubai? Or will she end up like her guardian, Jade Fox, who is in open defiance to that authority, who has been corrupted by her pain, and who tries to recruit Jen into a life of open rebellion? Most of the movie is Jen trying to figure out who she is. That is, it asks the question of how the feminine will relate to the masculine moving forward in light of its suffering. Now, before I go any further, if you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this video to someone who might benefit from its message because it's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. You can also hit the super thanks button. It's contained in those three little dots in the lower right-hand corner beneath the video and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you've derived from this episode. I really appreciate your support. In any case, Jen steals the green destiny as a mischievous last hurrah before she submits to her fate. In the process, however, Jen gets her first taste of death and killing and realizes that real life isn't like one of her martial arts novels. She comes into contact with one of the aspects of reality that the patriarchy had protected her from, that life is dangerous and lawless without the masculine ordering principle. And she is so frightened by the encounter that she returns the sword. As she does so, she is confronted by Lee, who offers to take her on as a student to provide her with guidance and structure. Unfortunately, in this offer, Jen only hears submission to yet another male authority of the superiority of the masculine over the feminine, and she refuses to accept, parroting Jade Fox's words of contempt for Rudan, the patriarchal institution that had snubbed Fox years ago. This is a really important point. The pain of Jade Fox's unfulfilled potential and unrealized dreams has corrupted her. Her revolt against the institutions that she blames for her pain makes a kind of sense and even requires a respectable measure of courage. However, despite everything she may have suffered at the hands of the patriarchy, nothing causes her more pain than Jen, whose talent and potential surpass her own and seem to have found a receptive audience in Li Mubai. Jade Fox indoctrinates Jen into her contempt for men generally, and Wudan specifically, not because it is in Jen's best interests, but because it allows her, Jade Fox, to maintain a precariously superior position vis-a-vis -vis Jen, a younger, more competent adversary. Jade Fox's indoctrination is not done out of kindness, but out of envy. Envy for everything Jen could be that she could not. We know this because even though the poison that Jade Fox uses, a compound called purple yin, purple meaning wounded, like a bruise, and yin meaning femininity, her poison is symbolically her wounded femininity, even though this poison ultimately kills Li Mu Bai, Jade Fox confesses that it was actually intended for Jen. In a real sense, Jen's physical poisoning would have been the culmination of a lifetime of emotional poisoning through different methods. However, at this part of the story, Jen has yet to really encounter the consequences of this indoctrination. Now, a few days after returning the sword on her wedding night, 
face to face with the prospect of consummating a marriage she doesn't want to a man she doesn't love, Jen tilts over into full defiance and steals the green destiny in earnest. To Jen, the sword, masculine power and authority, is the ability to be self-determined, to do what one wants. She does not understand the responsibility that comes with it. Jen has not been taught discipline and responsibility, though to be fair, she has not been willing to learn. And the sword in her hands becomes an instrument of the unsurrendered will. It's as if Jen, the long-suppressed feminine, says, enough, and a powerful force, the chaotic upsurgence of feeling begins to ripple through the story. In the original myth of Aladdin and the lamp, the genie isn't grateful for being released. He is homicidal for having been pent up for so long. And that's right. The longer a feeling has been suppressed, the more violent its resurgence when it is ultimately expressed. And let's be clear, this isn't all bad. On some level, the upsurgence of the feminine, of the yin principle, was necessary and inevitable. After all, after the sun, at the sun's zenith, it has already begun to set. For example, the feminine was what was missing from the life of Li Mu Bai, who is Yang incarnate. Li is so disciplined and so controlled that when he finally arrives at enlightenment, he can feel no joy or bliss because he has so completely suffocated his feeling state. As his benefactor says, even great heroes can be idiots when it comes to emotions. Indeed, the only time we ever see any kind of sensuality from Lee is when he's dancing with his sword in the moonlight, a kind of masturbatory surrogate for Shulian. However, it's through contact with Jen, who represents the insuppressible feeling state of femininity, that he finally finds the courage, courage, Lee's word from the word kur, meaning heart, that he finally finds the heart to admit his feelings for Shulian, accept himself fully, and redeem the life that he himself believed he would otherwise have wasted. In any case, now the genie is out of the bottle, Jen goes on her warpath. Unwilling to submit to any higher authority than herself, what does she do? She puts on men's clothing, takes up the phallic symbol of the masculine, and does whatever she wants which to her means becoming a man. Jen gleefully humbles the bullying machismo of a whole mob of men, fancying herself an indestructible sword goddess. It's the triumph of a woman who is no longer holding back and who can beat men at their own game. She destroys an entire building in the process, enjoying herself the entire time. This is the feminine wielding the power of the masculine without submitting to an ordering principle. And this is why, when he confronts her by the waterfall, Lee commands her to kneel, as he presumably did for his own master. But this, of course, is precisely what she cannot do. She cannot do it because she is indoctrinated by Jade Fox's resentment, because she considers submission to the masculine to be the death of her individual life, and because, on a purely conceptual level, yin, chaos, can't ever submit to order, otherwise it wouldn't be chaos. This is why order must always be imposed on chaos. That might be an uncomfortable fact for some people, but it is the truth. Fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, Jade's fate, Jen's fate is still undecided, and the possibility remains that she will choose to surrender her willfulness to impose order on her own chaos once she recognizes the true nature of that chaos. Unfortunately, this generally only occurs when we encounter the consequences of our actions. And the whole movie functionally consists of saving Jen from the consequences of her actions. Let's do a quick inventory, shall we? Over the course of the movie, Jen tries to shoot low with a bow, knocks him unconscious with a rock, stabs him in the chest, betrays her host, trespasses in his private rooms, steals his property, beats up dozens of people, destroys a restaurant, slices Xu Lian with a sword, spreads lies about Li Mu Bai, attempts to seduce him, and openly insults, taunts, and disrespects people who are continually going out of their way to help her. What a charmer. So why does she experience zero consequences? Because one of the traditional attitudes towards femininity is indulgence in the sense of leniency, forbearance, and protection. 
it's a privilege that femininity enjoys as a consequence of being traditionally deprived of power and authority. After all, if women could not, on a certain level, control their own actions, it would be cruel and unreasonable to hold them responsible for the consequences of their actions. Hence, indulgence as a uniquely feminine privilege. The issue here is that Jen, the feminine principle, has taken up masculine power and authority, has assumed her self-determination, and the rest of the world doesn't know what to do with her. She has the sword. Should we treat her like a man? But she's not a man, so should we treat her like a woman? Trust me, this would have been a very short movie had a man stolen the green destiny. That guy would have been cut down by Lee Mu Bai as the thief and traitor he was in the first five minutes. But no one really knows what to do with a woman who has abdicated the feminine and assumed the masculine, with a woman who will not submit to any authority beyond her own caprice. And this is where we find ourselves today. Again, we're discussing how things between men and women ended up the way they have. So let's recap. First, the masculine abdicated his power and authority. Next, the feminine seized that power because she was poisoned by the envy of an older generation who in turn was corrupted by resentment over patriarchal suppression. Then the feminine is maintained in her rebellion by her unwillingness to submit to any structure or authority outside of herself and by a society that literally doesn't know what to do with her and treats her with an indulgence which may no longer be appropriate. On the one hand, she can't really advance. She cannot truly embody the masculine, and she will likely eventually be consumed by the chaos and destruction she has wrought. And on the other hand, she cannot really retreat. She can't go back to the feminine, as her defiance has made returning to the way things were an impossibility. So we're at a kind of a standstill. So what ultimately happens? Well, Jen finally experiences the consequences of her actions when they lead to the death of Lee Mubai, the masculine principle. Only then does she appreciate that her actions may have far-reaching, permanent, and irreversible consequences, both for her and, importantly, other women. Jade Fox would have her believe that men are women's natural enemies, but the defeat of the masculine is a source of grief for the feminine. Jen has, after all, deprived Shulian of her love, which results in an implacable feeling of guilt when she is reunited with her own lover, Lo. Only then does Jen surrender her willfulness and make a sacrifice of her life. But then again, maybe this is just a fun movie about Kung Fu. What do I know? So this was a long analysis with a lot of interrelated parts. So I hope you are able to follow it. I do hope that you watch this movie for yourself if you haven't already. And let me know what you think about my analysis in the comments below. If you've gotten this far, you might as well become, uh, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You can also consider becoming a channel member with perks like priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. As always, thank you for listening.